This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, welcome. This is the Energy in America show, and I am not Jay Fidel. Jay is off today. I'm Maria Tome, and um, with me soon is Lou Puyarisi, and he's actually not even in Hawaii. I believe he's in Mexico City, and he's going to tell us about how important Mexico's election is to our energy situation. Hey, Lou, welcome to the show. Nice to be here. So um, our topic today is about the Mexican uh, election and its importance. So uh, maybe I should uh, start things off here. I've uh, been in Mexico City since uh, Sunday night, and I've been meeting with most of the senior people in the political parties, including, including one of the presidential candidates. And uh, the reason I'm here is to participate in a series of roundtable discussions on the Mexican energy reform, which uh, I don't know how many of your audience are familiar with it, but Mexico has had an enormous success with uh, privatizing and opening up their energy sector to uh, private investment, not just for oil and gas, but for renewable solar, wind, uh, an enormous part uh, privatization effort in the power sector, in the uh, midstream sector of moving uh, both electricity and natural gas and uh, petroleum products, and in the upstream sector where literally tens of uh, billions of dollars have been uh, committed for development of uh, Mexico's onshore and offshore oil reserves. So having said that, why don't we start, and we're going to tell a story today on why, how this election turns out is likely to have a very big effect on Mexico, but not just Mexico. Because what happens to Mexico is very important to the United States these days because of the integrated nature of our uh, energy markets. So let's go to the first slide. So this first slide, let me see, I have to pull it up myself, shows what uh, are the three leading candidates, right? And if you start with the one on the uh, upper side, the upper, I guess, the upper uh, right, upper left to you, is uh, the front runner is Andres uh, Obrador. Okay, and Obrador is run for office before, and he has made a lot of statements that the reform program has gone too far, that perhaps it should be uh, reviewed, and uh, although. The reforms were actually uh, implemented through a constitutional change, so it's not going to be that easy, or that easy to change. But over the over the provides a lot of uncertainties on the future of the reform movement in Mexico. And to his right, you will see Ricardo uh, Anaya, and but Ricardo Anaya is basically he is a free market guy, with some notable exceptions. The state oil company he wants to strengthen in the bit. But the main feature Anaya has is that he is not a member of the uh, so-called pre-government. Uh, and the pre-government is the government that's in power, and as we know in most democracies, if you've been in power for a while, um, the uh, voters tend to resent you. So, uh, so the runner, Jose Antonio Meade, is running for, uh, as a member of the pre-party. He's a very bright guy. He's very committed to the energy reforms. But right now, uh, and probably is quite difficult in Mexico, but right now Obrador seems to be in the lead, but we still don't know how the election is going to turn out. So if we go to the next slide, I think we're going to see, we're going to see why uh, Mexico remains very important to the United States. And this next slide shows the, uh, shows the uh, forecast for... Uh, uh, for U.S. natural gas exports going forward to 2040. Uh, the only thing I want you to take away from this slide, is, this picture, is that, as you can see, the U.S. was a major importer of natural gas until the onset of the North American Petroleum Renaissance. And we are now becoming uh, a net exporter of natural gas. In fact, probably sometime this year, the U.S. will be the largest producer of natural gas in the world, and the largest producer of crude oil in the world. 
But if you look at this chart, you can see that the U.S. is going to be exporting a lot of liquefied natural gas, largely to the Pacific Rim. But pipeline exports to Mexico are very important. But those pipeline exports to Mexico are largely because the reform movement in Mexico, the energy reforms, have allowed the development of uh, much more uh, natural gas pipelines and new power plants to replace fuel oil and aging coal plants throughout Mexico. And uh, you see, go to the next slide, which looks at U.S. natural gas exports to Mexico. Um, you can see here, not only is the U.S. selling pipeline gas to Mexico, but many people may be quite surprised is that Mexico last year was the most important destination for U.S. liquefied exports of U.S. liquefied natural gas. So these slides are showing you how important the Mexican market is for, uh, for U.S. producers to have easy access. And, uh, and I'm going to show you in a bit why that is important even for oil production. So do you have any questions? Okay, no, this is interesting. So the Mexican market is very important to the U.S. Uh, natural gas producers, both the liquefied natural gas piece and increasingly the uh, pipeline gas. Um, and you're going to mention how this, uh, how this is maybe affected by the upcoming election? Yes, so uh, okay. I want also, you know, uh, if we go to, let's go to the next, uh, the next slide for a second. And I think this is the... This shows Mexican consumption of gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and residual fuel oil. So, and you know, for most of your audience, I think when they think about uh, 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 crude oil, they really think about what it's made, you know, the, gas, the use of gasoline and diesel fuel. Of course, in the Hawaiian Islands, you actually use fuel oil, heavy fuel oil or low sulfur fuel oil today, for uh, producing uh, power. Now, you can see that Mexican demand for, for consumption for products has not risen rapidly. rapidly. But one of the interesting points of the reform movement is that the politicians said, if we proceed with reform, gasoline prices will come down. But in fact, gasoline prices were heavily subsidized in Mexico. And Mexico has a sort of historic uh, connection to the state oil company, Amex. It's part of the national patrimony. It's a kind of iconic historical event in Mexico from the 1930s when the government kicked all the oil companies out of Mexico and created a state oil company. So you can imagine these reform programs are very difficult to put in place. The other interesting aspects of Mexico, and go to the next slide, is you can see the imports of Mexico. And virtually, you can see that the imports have risen well, from 2008 to 400, 500,000 barrels a day to well over 800,000 barrels a day. And mostly gasoline, but some, some uh, diesel fuel oil, or what we call diesel, you know, that would, would include jet fuel. Now, those rising imports are the result of a couple of developments. First, uh, the refining industry in Mexico is very inefficient, it's old, and uh, the Mexican government has put more effort into uh, pipelines and upstream development, including bringing in foreign investment into upstream development. But the key, the key point here is that with, within the electorate in Mexico, you know, a lot of the nuances of how the reform program works do not necessarily you know, translate into a full understanding of the public. I mean, given your position, you must, under, you must have a lot of experience with trying to explain relatively complex developments in the NSD sector to the broader public. And this is the big political issue in Mexico now. The big political issue that, that many of the candidates are running on is that, look, the U.S. cannot trust the United States to provide adequate supplies, that the U.S., uh, that Mexico faces an energy security uh, problem, maybe an energy security crisis. And after the election, the government should step in and put money into refineries 
money into uh, developing uh, effective supplies of natural gas. Now, we do, they do have an extensive program to uh, bring in foreign investment for these. But what is turning out is that the, the, the integration of the U.S. and the Mexican market is actually good for both countries. For Mexico, they have access to cheap natural gas. The U.S. natural gas at the border is, there, is the lowest cost in the world today. About uh, less than three thousand dollars a thousand cubic feet. In addition, the U.S. is exporting between two and three million barrels a day of petroleum products, much of it to Latin America, and probably of these imports here of eight hundred thousand barrels a day, two thirds of that come from the United States. Now, why is all of this so important? And I think it comes to the last slide. I mean, to, well, we have two more slides. First, the next slide shows you the dollar value of energy trade between the U.S. and between Mexico and the United States. And you can see that this is a very big deal. Uh, in 2016, probably Imports from Mexico to the U.S. is 10, no, 10 billion. But Mexico is actually buying in petroleum products and natural gas nearly $20 billion from the U.S. So in the energy sector, even though we hear all this criticism about trade with Mexico, in the energy sector, the balance of trade favors the United States by a large margin. Now, the final slide on this little discussion here is uh, shows us the relationship of a, of, between oil production and associated natural gas. And this is the key point for, for U.S. energy security. And the reason it is is because in the United States, in the unconventional, you think about the United States, it's probably gone from 5 to 10 million barrels a day of oil production in, what we, in, in a remarkably short period of time. In fact, in the history of the world oil market, the expansion of U.S. oil production over this short period of time, I think from about 2009 to 2014, is the largest expansion of oil production in that period of time in any one country in the history of the world. A lot of reasons for that, private mineral rights, the fact that uh, uh, development of unconventional resources can take place in very quickly. But... An interesting thing about unconventional oil development in the United States is that it doesn't happen without a very important byproduct, which brings that crude oil to the surface of the earth, and that is natural gas. So, if you produce crude oil in the United States, and let's take a look at two of these um, the major sort of productions across the unconventional space, you can see that the black line on the left side, which shows gas, it shows horizontal versus vertical wells, but the steep curve is uh, from what we call vertical wells. And you can see that natural gas production is climbing right along oil production. Also, we produce a lot of water. That, that's another issue that we need to talk about at some point. But the important point is that if you produce oil in the unconventional space in the United States, you produce a lot of gas, and you need to find a home for that gas. You actually really don't care how much money you get for that gas. You need to find a home for it, because if you don't produce that gas, you have to flare it. And in, even in Texas, you cannot flare gas for more than 60 days. And if you can't find a home for that gas, you have to curtail production of your crude oil. You cannot separate the production of those two products um, in, uh, in, in the unconventional oil and gas space in the United States. Yeah. Yes, we have dry gas production and gas production without oil in the Marcellus in Pennsylvania. But in the vast part of the unconventional oil space, it comes with this natural gas. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a the integration. Fight. Yeah, the integration um, of the technology side of the thing and the uh, um, political and the economic I, I, is very is very interesting, and I look forward to hearing you um, talk more about how the um, the balance of trade and the balance of products are both very important. I think we need to uh, take a quick break. 
Um, so don't don't go away. Do we'll that. be right back. All right. Thank you. <laughs> this is Think Tech Hawaii raising public awareness. Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. Hey, welcome back to Energy in America with Lou from Mexico City talking about the importance of the upcoming Mexican election to America's energy um, situation. So, Lou, please continue. So, if we go back to our last chart, I think the point I would like to make here is that because the, if you think about a joint product, now what is a joint product? Well, you think about Think about cattle. It's very difficult to produce beef without also producing leather. They sort of come together. Right? And this is the case with oil and gas in the unconventional sort of resources of the United States. And we cannot use all the gas we produce in this unconventional space. And so finding export markets, LNG and particularly Mexico, which is now taking nearly 10% of all the natural gas produced in the United States. It's a huge benefit for Mexico, and it's a huge benefit for the international, for the U.S. economy. And what the data shows, particularly the class chart, is that if we start to have difficulty in marketing our natural gas to domestic sources, foreign uh, pipeline shipments to Mexico, or even liquefied natural gas shipment to the world market, uh, we are going to then have trouble with uh, continuing the expansion of the oil production. In fact, we may begin to lose some oil production. So, uh, so what happens in Mexico, in this election, in, this, in our neighbor to the south, so to speak, is actually much more important than many Americans may think. And in the coming, and this election is going to take place on July 1st, and I must say, I've had a, just a fascinating time here uh, talking to uh, energy analysts, uh, producers, consumers, utility companies, and on, on the issue, and, and about the sort of transformation of the Mexican market. I mean, Mexico is an industrialized society. It thinks of itself, it used to think of itself historically as a producer, but it is now the major consumers of petroleum, petroleum products, and oil, you know, oil and gas in the world market today. And how we integrate with this market, particularly over the struggle over NAFTA, is very important. And I, I sort of feel we've not spent enough effort in this on the U.S. side. Yeah, thank you. Very, very interesting. So does Mexico, um, does the election have an effect on Mexico's production? I mean, does it have natural gas and petroleum resources of its own? Is that part of the dynamic, or is that further down the road? So Me yeah. Mexico was a major producer. It produced well over 3.5 million barrels a day. Uh, it was run by a state oil company. It did not have competition within the market. It was wholly owned by the state of Mexico, by the government. And in fact, unlike the United States, no part of Mexico has privately held mineral rights. One of the reasons the U.S. oil and gas um, production expanded so rapidly is that the mineral rights were owned privately and came outside a lot of the political review that makes it so difficult to do energy projects. Not just oil and gas energy projects, but renewable projects. 
any project in which the government's land is involved or government, the federal government's review is involved, as you well know, uh, can be a great deal of difficulty to get these projects implemented. So Mexico underwent, which it can only be described as one of the most remarkable reforms. They changed the Constitution. They have well over, I think, nearly $200 billion of investment, hard investment commitments for the development of offshore oil resources, onshore oil and gas resources, uh, renewable resources, and they desperately need uh, a lot of infrastructure to make this happen. Uh, as you know, the renewable uh, renewable fuels are, are both intermittent and variable. They do not yet we do not yet have a battery technology that can give us a, a 24-hour uh, on-demand uh, delivery of this of power from renewables. So we're getting better at it. The Mexicans will need a lot of gas either produced domestically or from the U.S. But if the election, if, 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 the, if one of the candidates, particularly, I guess, Obrador, if he comes in and he claims he's going to review the contract, but recently he's made more conciliatory statements. But there's going to be a lot of uncertainty on what's going to happen to the development. And this can have, of course, as we've just seen, an important uh, uh, effect on the United yeah. States and could even harm the U.S. Uh, production platform. Okay. So if you were going to um, state your concerns, if things, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, would harm the U.S. production, um, what would that look like? What would that situation be? So I think the particular harm would be that uh, gas demand falls. And this gas and this fall this gas demand finds uh, producing fields in the Permian Basin, probably our most prolific uh, unconventional oil fields today, find the uh, gas uh, demand falling. Producers then are forced to either flare the gas or shut in. But even in the Texas Railroad Commission, which regulates oil and gas in Texas, they will not permit flaring more than 60 days. Uh, it's combusting uh, methane right into the atmosphere. It's not good for the environment. It's actually against the law. And so producers will then begin to have to curtail their oil production or find other markets for that natural gas, and that will not be easy to do. Do, do we have adequate so export? You could argue, Sorry, do we have adequate, we, and we don't have adequate export capacity at the moment to just quickly move that out? We do not. It's a very long, you know, it takes a very long time to build LNG export capacity. We have it coming online, but these are these export facilities cost 10 to 20 billion dollars. They're extremely expensive. They take a long time to get permitted, all the infrastructure to put in place. So this is a, this is a long-term game, not a short-term game. So one of the things I've suggested to the Mexicans is that, um, you know, the Mexicans talk a lot about energy security. They say, well, you know, we're too dependent on the United States, and uh, we should, but. You know, it may not, it's not really cost effective for them to try to develop their own resources in a very short period of time. It's just not going to happen. So my suggestion then is they try to find a way to engage the U.S. and look at joint strategies to, to sort of build confidence. More storage in Mexico, uh, cooperative efforts to build out more infrastructure, and more resiliency with the grid. So there are a lot of things that can be done. It can kind of tone down the politics of it. Yeah. Well, thank you. I know we only have a few um, seconds left, um, and I think we're all looking forward to seeing the results of the Mexican election more so now than before we started this conversation. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> do you have a final? Um, Comment: Are you going to be talking about this more? Are you leaving Mexico City and then coming back after? Oh uh, no, I'm leaving Mexico. I think after the election, it might be. It, it, I think after the election, it might be worthwhile to um, uh, revisit this issue again. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So. Um, and uh, I'll talk, uh, I'm, I'm happy to sort of talk about that if there's some interest.
Yeah, well, thank you very, very much. And I hope you have a good rest of your visit there and productive conversations with all the folks who have insights to offer as you have offered your insights um, to us. Okay, great. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha.